Hey, what is up guys? It's your boy Speed here, and today we're gonna be talking about Amars Kunkka. This guy was insane in the Smash, crazy early game, like his first 15 minutes was some wild, wild stuff. His landing stage is honestly obscenely impressive. Everything about this guy's gameplay in this match, outside of maybe some like late game stuff, maybe the Octarine core that he bought, wasn't the best. We'll talk about it, we'll get into it, but without further ado, congrats to Team Falcons. Let's break down Amar's gameplay, and all right, I'll see you guys there. All right, before we get into the main part of the video, I do wanna let you guys know that I'm not only posting videos here on YouTube, I also frequently post videos on the website. If you don't know what I'm talking about, almost every single day, I'm posting a new video to the Game League website. We're gonna teach you guys in depth about how to get to the next level. So if you want to become absolutely broken, click the link down below and sign up. Okay, so getting into landing stage, just max damage. And I think in a lot of games, he prioritizes damage. Like you could imagine against the Luna Venge that you would want to buy a stick, right? Like the old build of Gauntlet, Gauntlet, Branch, Branch, Stick, right? I can see that build being viable this game, but he does not decide to do that, right? He decides to go max damage. Now, I think what I like about his landing stage, to be honest, this is a bit lucky. Like the range tree dying first. It's very convenient for Kunkka because it makes a really easy decision of just hitting the range creep with Tide. So I don't know why that happened. I think it was a Mickey bad block, but that was really fortunate. From there, he's going to pull a ton of creep aggro. Like legit, he pulls aggro three times in a row. And I think the main goal of this is just to make sure that these creeps stay alive. These creeps don't die, right? By pulling aggro away like this, it makes these melee creeps not die, right? And that makes range heroes like Luna take a lot of damage if they try to get aggressive. Then he CSs these creeps seemingly as late as possible, right? He doesn't CS them in range. And trust me, I assure you this is intentional. And it's crazy for me to see this because like, I don't know, this isn't, isn't really something I've seen before where he's CSing as late as possible. He's not just last hitting, he's last hitting late because this has been in range for like a hit or two now, but he hits it late. And I think the goal is to get the creeps to push in as slow as possible right? Not let this wave go under tower. He does this throughout, honestly, a huge part of the lane. Then on the first melee, tides through, hits the Luna with that. That's the perfect tide bringer, right? Where it hits the CS and the enemy hero. And now he's got this double wave, right? He's got this double wave because of when he's done, which is primarily spam aggro and also use tide bringer to push the wave slightly. Then from there, it's more aggro. I'm gonna kill off the range creep here. And from there, he starts getting the lane back shortly. Torrents to try to get the range, which I think he did get. Uh, one more Tidebringer before getting the lane back here. And now you're going to notice when he pulls the lane back here, what he's going to do is pull aggro off the portrait of one of the enemy heroes, right? So you'll notice right after this CS, which he hits late again, he uses the Luna portrait. His cursor moves up to the portrait. If you use your deny command on the enemy portrait, it will pull aggro, right? And so he does that to pull aggro once. And then he pulls aggro off the Venge because she just sees the Venge. It's, I guess, slightly easier and does that again. And that keeps the lane back once again, as long as possible, getting it into a better position. Then as the wave pushes up, I just like to really show you guys some of the small stuff that goes into being a pro player. So as he pulls aggro here, he notices that this melee might de aggro. So it's really important that he actually hits that melee so it, it doesn't run back, right? So the melee creep that's furthest away is the one you have to hit. I just want to show it again so you guys can really see what I'm talking about, right? When you pull aggro, the creep that is furthest away is most likely to de-aggro and run back to the weight. And that is this creep in the sequence, right? It is closest to this creep and closest to the weight. And so by hitting it, it makes sure that it does not de-aggro. That's just another one of those small things that like super matters. Right at a pro level where everyone's so good at keeping equilibrium, if you don't do that, if this creep de aggros, it's gonna make sure that Mickey can potentially pull the lane back, right? Or it's gonna make sure that you can't pull the lane back, right? It's gonna have these consequences. Then he hits a tiebringer on Insignia as Insignia approaches. And this kind of makes sense. Kunga's kind of bad early on. Like, if you can't hit Torrent, it's not a good trading spell. Like, Tidebringer is inconsistent with harass, but he's made it look like a consistent harass tool. Uh, and then he gets full gone on and usually with Venge level two, this works because this spell is pretty broken, right? Wave of Terror and Magic Missile are so good at level one. But yeah, he's able to come over here, hits the torrent on Insania and instead of getting first blooded, he gets first blood and the game snowballs from there, right? And, and it all snowballs from like the good CS, the good harass, the good aggro. Right, that kill attempt was pretty close to Amar's tower. It was pretty far back. It was in a position crit could help him with, and it's just all the small things. So if you guys are like, why can't I get the high rank? 
It's, it's so much small shit you can't even believe. And now his good lead is all gonna pay off because when he hits level 6, now he can be an absolute menace to this Luna, right? Typically Luna's pretty decent against Kunkka in lane. I mean, Kunkka becomes very strong in the later levels, but usually Luna is able to get a lead due to her natural strong point at level 3. But because he hits 6 first, he can just run her out of the lane and then use his phase boots to continue to do the same thing or look for a rotation. This ridiculous phase boots triple bracer timing is just going to make a 7 minute fight be really easy for Kunkka. And I like that he's really aware. He also takes a cult bracelet, probably because you need a bit of mana on this hero. I will say I feel like there are certain items that are a little bit better. Maybe he likes the stats, it's, a, it's hard to exactly say. But he's going to cut up this wave and then the enemy team is actually going to make a play mid and he's going to read it. So he cuts the wave here, drags it up the hill, farms it, which I thought he would use the Tidebringer to hit this camp as well. I'm kind of surprised he didn't do that. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that would definitely be more efficient because he ends up farming this camp anyway. So should have done that. But what I like is that he cuts the wave and then farms here because that allows him to now come mid. He's really close to mid and that is what he does. He walks mid, easy torn X combo on the Marana. She does leap away but he's able to chase her down. Worst case, he would force out a double leap, which is honestly not bad. It's a super long cooldown. And then he hits level seven and he's ready to now fight bottom. He can actually even pressure Tidehunter if he needs to, because Tidebringer is actually one of the better spells at countering Tidehunter. But he doesn't do that immediately. He farms up the large camp here. Kunkka is one of the best farming heroes in the game and the enemy team actually ends up diving. They kind of dive in, in a very reasonable way. I thought this was a good dive at, at first sight because typically you wouldn't be this far behind against Kunkka. And also you've taken this tier one. So I feel like it definitely makes a lot of sense. But Amar with his strong timings is able to come in here, misses the torrent. Well, I guess it hits the tide, but it doesn't do anything. <laughs> uh, and ends up settling for the tide kill, which I really like. I think a lot of people would have chased the Mirana or chased the Venge here and they would have overextended. He's happy just getting the free kill, right? He understands that this is a nice kill. It's 500 gold. It's a pretty big swing in net worth. No need to get overly greedy. And he's back to farming. And once again, he is willing to slow down the game. Like I do want to highlight he's farming sometimes. Uh, it's mainly when Boat is on cooldown now that he's going to slow down, hit some neutral camps and wait for Boat to come back up because that is the main tool of Kunkka, right? 400 damage at level one makes Ghost Ship one of the better nukes in the early game. And yeah, we see it here. He farms up. Oh. My ghost ship is back up. Okay, I'm gonna go kill. Let's go get some kills, guys. And then Storm runs out of mana. And he happens to be next to the Storm. Bit of a mistake from Nisha, right? Nisha obviously probably not expecting the Kunkka to be here. But the Kunkka is here. And that sets up for a nice little go. And Nisha just couldn't get enough mana to go over the hill. <laughs> and they take him out. The next point is honestly really impressive just from Team Falcons as a whole. Like, their, their team is just so on point. Right, they're all farming the back camps. It's something pretty cool, right? The the Hoodwink is farming, the CM can farm, the Gyro's taking Ancients. Like, it's a very natural map setup. Marlene is playing mid with the Blink Dagger, so he can be followed up by his supports. And Amar is kind of just waiting. He's hitting these in-between camps, and notice how he's not really hitting this camp, or this camp, or this camp. I mean, he'll hit these camps if there's like a big cooldown, like maybe Dragon Form is on cooldown, or Boat's on cooldown. But if everything is up, He's going to farm generally around his team. He's going to opt for these camps primarily. And that's very important to understand, guys. Like, these pros pick their camps based on how fast they want to play, right? And so now he ends up TPing bottom, which is just crazy because it's a read that 33 is going to hit the wave. They completely call out 33. They're like, yeah, you're going to hit this wave. You're an overfarm Tide Hunter. And they mass TP on him. I mean, which is so insane because, like, Tide usually feels safe at this point in the game. But they have the Hoodwink. They have Kunkka. They have two of the best answers to Tide Hunter in the game. Because, right, Kunkka X cannot be dispelled. So Kraken Shell doesn't really give you a way out. And they pick up the kill. All right, and for the last clip before he starts feeding... No, I'm kidding. Honestly, Liquid, their draft seemed very winnable after a couple of the mid-game fights. Like, they made a couple of really great smokes and had some really great execution on the team fights, but they were just way too far behind on net worth. Like, it was kind of a shame. Uh, it really looked like if Falcons wasn't on point, if they weren't super clean with their gameplay, that they would probably get outscaled, that they would hit a timing where maybe the team fights just wouldn't be in their favor, right? Like the arrow follow up on some of the stuns would just be too good. But okay, last fight of the game. I think at this point, he just understands that he can just run in, right? If there are no BKBs, Blade Mail is too effective. And Liquid understands how good this Blade Mail is and how much magic damage there is from the side of Falcons because they are buying double early BKB, right? There's no Kaya on Storm. The Luna is not even going meta. They're saying this game is bad. We need BKBs to have a chance. 
right? And so they go double BKB, but Falcon sees for sure that they don't have these items completed yet, but maybe they're going for them. And Amara is like, okay, I see you're going BKB. And he just leads with the boat, right? He tanks a smoke, tanks a moonlight, and he's so good to understand that this is them actually looking to set up a kill, right? And he does that by kind of just reading the map, right? No one pushing out the side lanes. And so he gets off his boat. That's going to make him incredibly tanky. They're going to all in him, gets hit by an arrow, but it just doesn't matter. He gets off the blade mount, which, you know, is going to help him tank some of the eclipse and feel good about it. And uh, yeah, it's just an easy fight. Torrent Storm, Venge can't move. Tide couldn't really do enough. It's a decent Ravage to try to kill off the Hoodwing, but I don't even think they get the Hoodwing. Oh, God. And yeah, Exxon to the Venge. They'll finish her off once the, once the Shard comes up. Actually, he considers it. I think he'll catch her anyway, right? Surely. Wow, what a play from Insania. <laughs> okay, that's disrespectful. All right, thank you guys so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed. Hopefully you learned quite a bit from the early mid game of Amar. I was just really, really impressed with the first 22 ish minutes of the game. And I was like, all right, I have to make a video on this. This guy, this guy is incredible. Like, honestly, he is incredible. His gameplay is nuts. But okay, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. And I'm out. Peace. And that's all. But remember, before you leave, come on, before you tune out, subscribe to the Game Leap website where we are going to help you get to the next rank. If you're stuck, click the link down below. And I'm out. Peace.